new to all problems in respiratory bacterial diseases of livestock and overview. So I thought, first of all, I'll share with you our group. So it's a microbiology research group. Um, we are split into two. There's the respiratory disease um, part, which is Pet Blackall, me, and Lida Omalecki. And then there is the food safety, which is Gillian Templeton. We have um, two technical officers. We have um, PhD students, masters in, at the moment, and honor student as well. Um, because um, respiratory disease is mainly a problem in the intensive livestock, so we work mainly in the cattle industry, in the pig industry, and the chicken. Um, I, I have structured, the, structured this talk in the sense that I will talk about the complexity of respiratory diseases and highlighting this with several projects we have done. The first one will be the Pleurisy project. We have a new species. Um, we will look at Pastorella multicida, primary and secondary pathogens. Again, another species from koalas. We look at some beef-based assays and on farm assays, and then some of the background, the basic, the basic knowledge kind of research we're doing at the moment as well. So, um, respiratory disease is is very complicated, complicated by many factors. So in many instances, it is not just one single pathogen um, that causes the disease, but it is a range of pathogens or a range of environmental factors. So we have the viral and the bacterial pathogens and all the environmental stressors. We have, um, for example, some bacteria like the Mycoplasma hyaluronia and the um, porcine circle virus, which is the, one of the only, there's two viruses in the pigs. This is the only um, really main one. Um, and both these are synergistic, which means by themselves, they're really not, they don't really cause much disease. But when there's other pathogens around, they become highly pathogenic. And that complicates the whole story. Um, so I will, um, first of all, show you how this is complicated with the Pleurisy project we did. Um, pleurisy is the inflammation of the pleura. The pleura is um, basically the membrane that surrounds the lung. And if that ins is inflamed, it impairs the lubrication function and it causes a lot of pain when they're breathing. Pleurisy is mainly caused by pneumonia um, in the cases we look at, but it can be caused by other diseases, um, chest or abdominal diseases as well. Um, we did a study um, and wanted to find out if there are certain bacterial species that are associated with pleurisy at the abattoir. So these are healthy pigs going to the abattoir. Um, and what was really surprising was the abundance of bacterial species we found in these healthy, in the lungs of these healthy pigs. Um, and so we looked at 46 farms, and out of 46 farms, 38 had streptococcus suis. Out of um, 46, 34 had mycoplasma hyaluronia, and 29 had PCV2. And these are the, the two species I just talked, that they are synergistic, so that is a problem. We had 29 that had actobacillus species. We had um, 24 that had pastorella, multicida, and seven that had actobacillus pneumonia, which, which is a major pathogen as well, and then some other ones. Um, so except for the mycoplasma, high pneumonia is a very hard to grow. It takes seven days to grow, so we did not culture this one. So we looked at that by PCR. And the PCV2, which we can't culture, we looked at that by PCR as well. The others were all cultured. Um, and basically, we took swabs from the lungs and cultured that and had a relative abundance value for that. Now, the ones that were in really high numbers were the Streptococcus suis, Pastorella multicida, multicida, and Ectobacillus pneumonia. When they are in high numbers on the on a plate, that means that they are most likely the causative agent of pleurisy. 
So that's a bit of a concern because these are really um, pathogenic bacteria and they are in high numbers in healthy foods. Um, now, don't try to work this out. It's a very complicated um, picture. But what I'm trying to show is the abundance of the species and the difference different species. Um, so each of the, uh, oops, that was not supposed to happen. Each of these um, squares represents a batch of pigs. And the, in the corner here is the pleurisy score. So that means the pleurisy score of that batch where these pigs came from. Um, each square has about each batch, we collected up to five lungs. That is, if you could find five lungs with pleurisy. Um, so it's ordered from very low pleurisy um, all the way down here to very high pleurisy. So what you can see, the interesting point I wanted to point out with this is the diversity. So each of these colors represents a different bacteria. There's a lot of diversity in the farms. So you see different colors you also see different colors um, between the pigs. So I'll have, this is basically the highest one. And we go, these are sort of the lowest, no, not highest, sorry, the lowest extremes. And these are the highest ones. So we had a batch here with 63% pleurisy. That means 63% of the pig in, pigs in this batch had pleurisy, which is a very high number. But you can see here that um, they have um, different pathogens. Um, not all have the same. Um, it's very variable. So in other words, we could not really um, found a clear link between a certain bacteria and what caused pleurisy, this high pleurisy at the farm. Um, the whole picture gets more complicated due to new species. So we found a new species of bacteria. Um, this makes the whole thing yeah, much more complicated. Um, we had a student that was looking at housekeep housekeeping teams. Um, the vets used to send us bacteria and by the 16S, <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> Um, hang on. Okay. By the 16S, um, these bacteria were some Actobacillus species. And, but the 16S has problems with differentiating bacteria from the bit, um, closely related bacteria within the Pastoralaceae family. So with the Actobacillus, it has. Um, has a lot of problems. So we weren't quite sure, but we kept on collecting them over the years. And this student looked at all these species. And she did the rec and housekeeping team, the RPO and the THDF. And she looked at these species. And the interesting one is this one here. So she found 17 strains that we now um, know is a different species and we call it Glacerella australis. Now, um, we did some phenotypic analysis to make sure that it is a different species, and here on the bottom, in the orange are the, so basically it can be differentiated by the reaction to catalase and indole. Um, we then went further and looked at the whole genome and looked at the 16S again and it is related to um, Glacerella parasuis. This was formerly known as H. Paras Hermophilus parasuis. Um, it now came into a different genus. And then to the Actobacillus indolicus. Now these Glacerella parasuis and Actobacillus indolicus are, they're, again, they're very hard to separate. So it's related to both of them, but um, So the interesting point about this new bacteria we found is that it actually got two disease scenarios. So we have one on farm where you find coughing, a slower growth rate, and this is all in pigs. This is a pig pathogen. Um, a slower growth rate um, with increased deaths in the grower phase. 
which is it's very detrimental because the grower face is basically the face just before they go to the abattoir. Um, and if you lose pigs there, that's a major loss. Um, so pigs are found dead on farm. They have multifocal necrotizing fibrinal suppurative pneumonia and rapid necrotizing um, necro necrosis, necrosis in, uh, and autoanalysis of the affected lungs. So that's on farm, what you see on farm. The other disease scenario, which most of the farm actually has, they don't see anything at the farm. They might have the odd coughing, but that's all they see on the farm. However, when it goes to slaughter, they have a very high pleurisy. They have very large lung abscesses and a high percent of lung lesions and also association with heart disease. Um, so these are some of the lungs. So what is another worry is in here, this lesion looks exactly like you have lesions of ectobacillus pneumonia, which is a major pig, like I said before, major pig pathogen, which means that this could have potentially been um, confused when there's a lot of what you do in the pig industry, you go to the abattoir and you basically check for pleurisy you check for whether they have APP, so exobacillus pneumonia, and, and you sort of give a report back as a vet. He will give a report, and if he sees this kind of lesion, he would say, oh, yeah, you've got APP on your farm. Um, and this, this is just one of the abscesses. You see these abscesses in um, uh, exobacillus pneumonia as well. So... Basically, I was told by people that look at the abattoir, we probably would have confused this. So that's another problem with that we don't know all the species that are actually there. Um, so at the moment, we have a student that is doing, or no, we actually did a PCR to differentiate the two pathogens. And that is currently used to screen some farms. A student is, is doing that for us. Um, so we validated this PCR um, on, we have found some more of these um, new species, 36 of them now all together. And we, it's a multiplex, so it will differentiate between Placerella australis and Actobacillus pneumonia. And um, we obviously have all the reference strains and it will also look at Placerella. That's also differentiated because all these three pathogens are in the grow-out phase. They cause problems there, so we have included them all. We also looked at isolate-related um, species. Um, we're presenting um, 12 genera and 26 species and two, two taxa, which, which are not defined. And it definitely comes up with the right species and none of the related species come up. So it's working very well and it's been used now. Um, passerella, um, we're going to the next one and the next problem, which is a primary and a secondary pathogen. So the disease complex is basically further complicated um, that some of the pathogens have a dual role. They can be either normal flora or they can be a primary pathogen. So the example here is pastorella. Um, we know that on some farms, pastorella is a primary pathogen. And on other farms, it's just a secondary. It just comes in after the, another, um, another pathogen has come in. So what's a primary pathogen? What is defined as a primary pathogen? Um, when in microbiology, when you isolate it as pure or dominant um, culture, then um, that's an indication. So this culture here, you would see, this is basically a pure culture, what you would see in, um, from a swab from a lung. Um, it's found in multiple organs, and it's found in multiple pigs. And they're all all isolates are a single genotype. And if you vaccinate with that genotype, um, it should work. 
highly pathogenic strains are norm normally strains that have severe symptoms from one um, strain of bacteria, and it's basically clonal in nature. So the pig veterinarians se um, sent us some um, strains which they believe are um, um, the causative agent. Um, they cause severe disease, and they basically um, fitted the explanation of a primary pathogen. And when we had, we, we had also some other um, pastorella from other cases, which were mixed cases, um, and we had a look at them with the rat PCR at the diversity. And basically, this um, here, this cluster here, are the includes, except three, includes all the main um, strains, all the primary, uh, supposedly primary pathogens they sent us. So it's in one cluster. Um, when we look at this cluster a bit, so this is this cluster. Um, I'm going a little bit down. We will look at the second part of the pl cluster. And when we look at this here, so we have um, here from the farm, so I'll concentrate on farm 24. We found um, a pure culture. We were sent three lungs um, from the samples for the pure culture. A little bit later, the outbreak occurred again, and we were sent 10 samples, and again, the rat PCR told us it's the same strain. Um, when we look at what actually happened on the farm, so they had um, given the pigs um, a vaccine. And with this strain, we isolated. And um, after four months, there was significant improvement in the respiratory disease health, and also the pleurisy at the abattoir was resolved. For some unknown reason, they stopped this vaccine, and all the issues occurred again. So that would definitely indicate this is a primary pathogen. So we, so in summary, we have strains that seem to be able to cause disease by themselves. Some of the strains recovered on uh, recovered from more than one farm. Strains recovered from multiple animals, and vaccination seems to help. So we want to have a further look at what makes these strains um, highly pathogenic and what makes them being the primary pathogen while others are not. What is the difference? And that's, yeah, future. So then we had some more species. I uh, want to go to koalas, a new species here. Um, we have recently recognized a novel lone pinella species that is the normal flora in koalas. And um, it's also a pathogen. Um, it, it was discovered as a pathogen in humans, humans bitten by koalas. So we also we had a visitor, Carmen, from Spain. And she sampled some wildlife. And among them is the koala on the left there. Um, that was a very interesting project. <laughs> Pity I couldn't go to all the sampling. Um, so we then had, again, another student looking at um, these with two housekeeping scenes. She looked at it with the RPOA and the rag N. And this is the combination of both these genes into a tree. Um, and we want to look at this cluster down here. I'll bring this up a bit. So here is the lone panella koalarum, um, which is the, this is basically the only known strain from koalas that is, has been defined. Now the numbers, the MS numbers here, are the ones from human bites. The other ones are uh, the BR numbers, are the ones um, that were collected by Carmen from koalas. So what we can see, we have basically three, three clusters here. And one, one of the bite ones seems to be more closely related to the reference strain of um, Lone Panella koalarum, while the other ones 
um, the other ones seem to be correlated with this um, um, cluster four, and then also cluster five seems to be a little bit standalone here. We hypothesize that these are um, different species, and at the moment we have a student that is looking at this and look, doing the same thing as we did for the Clasarella australis. She's looking at the phenotypic, she's looking at the whole genome and trying to figure out what we have here. So what, we, what was shown by the, by the koala samples is basically that they can be natural pathogens, but if they just um, normal flora of the koala, but in other species they might have different disease scenarios. Um, another thing that is um, diagnostic is obviously very important. Um, it's vital for the treatment. What's also vital is what's what's also important is that when animals are shifted from different habitats and they come into another habitat and there's a pathogen, there, there might be pathogens they're not, they have never encountered and therefore they're naive to them, their immune system is not familiar with it. So in a recent case, we looked at squirrel colliders and there was a, squirrel colliders were shifted to another zoo and they actually brought with them to this other zoo uh, um, a pathogenic strain of Pastorella multicidus, and, and this strain caused death in the zoo where they were trying, or in the zoo and in, in the enclosure where they brought to, to the other squirrels that were in this enclosure. So it's the reason I'm mentioning this is that we're now going to cattle. Um, so cattle come from different regions. Um, they come together in a feedlot, and it's basically the same scenario as with the squirrel glider. They come from where they have been exposed to some pathogens. They might be fine there, but then they come all together, and they encounter different pathogens they have never encountered before. Um, so it's, so it's, it's vitally important to diagnose these, these obviously, at a feedlot and to treat the animals. And... Here we, um, this is a project where we develop a bead-based assay um, to detect all these pathogens. So what I said, yeah, they come together and we're trying to diagnose them with this assay and then treat, they can be treated for disease. So just a little bit of background on this disease. You might have heard this before, but um, bovine respiratory disease um, is rated as a major health problem in the um, medium and large feedlots in Australia. Apparently 64% of all illnesses and deaths are attributed to respiratory disease. It's economically ob obviously very, it's a seriously economic loss because feedlot occurs, the cattle have been growing for up to two years. They then get for the last couple of months, they go to a feedlot to get marble beat, to put on heaps of weight, and then they get sold. If you lose them at that stage, that's obviously a major loss. Um, so the loss is due to mortality. It's also the cost of um, treatment, um, and it's the cost of labor, and obviously the reduced performance by the cattle if they are affected, and the carcass merit. So this is the marbling. They don't get this marbling. Um, what you want when you send them to the feedlot. Apparently, the cost and the, the estimated cost to the domestic industry is $60 million a year. So, and again, it's linked to um, three things, the stress, viral and bacterial infection. They say, so, um, mixing cattle from different source is, the, is one of the main ones, like we already said. There's also the environmental temperature fluctuation. So when they come from a warm climate to a little bit colder area, or the very low temperatures, which seem to be a major factor for outbreaks, which is environmental stressor. Um, so the aim in this one is we wanted to identify Mannheimia hemolytica, Pastorella multicida, Histophilus somni, 
Chuparella pyrogenes, Mycoplasma bovis, and Bebastania trehalosi. Um, we looked at 20, 22 reference strains, three field strains for the species, and then 21 related species. And we also looked at 180 field isolates taken from internal and nasal cavities of cattle, Australian cattle. Um, luminous microbead based suspension area array is um, it's very rapid, the high throughput method, and it's used for detection of multiple analytes in solution. And this is kind of what you get as a result. So this is, um, you get basically a percentage, so the percent of, percentage of beads that are lightening up. Um, and um, this was, um, this is all the, um, um, hang on, I need to go one back. Beat best assay, you basically have to do a PCR before and then you uh, hybridize this to beats and then you get um, your answer in, in that kind of format. Um, it's very specific, so um, the white ones here, the white pathogens, the pathogens are here. The white ones lined up with the right primers or the beads for, for this pathogen. Um, we tested it against um, species here, um, related species. It was fine, didn't come up. Now, the one we really struggled with was the Mannheimia exotocida. And looking at literature, this is the main one, Mannheimia hemolytica. It's really, really hard to separate from Mannheimia exotocida. And we were really struggling with this. There's also some other ones. Um, which are also um, very closely related. So it's either struggling with this one. If you then change your primers a little bit, it has problems with the other one. So we tried a lot of primers. We tried different tags. You say attach tags to your primers. We, are, we, we really tried, and we could not separate these two. So we decided, well, we'll just do a single plex assay afterwards just to make sure that this was the problem. Um, we found out in the literature that many of the um, Mannheimia hemolytica assays actually don't even look at these related species. Um, okay, so yeah, this, the field isolates, we then tested the 180 field isolates and they all showed specific reactions, so they all came up. Let's go to the next one, on-farm assays. Um, as we discussed before, obviously um, the diagnosis is important for the treatment, but what's, what tends to be now happening is that we actually want to know, preferably would want to know at the farm level, what am I actually dealing with or what antibiotic um, resistance am I dealing with? Because there's obviously when you send something to the lab, there is a gap between the, when you actually get the results back. And that can sometimes be very delayed. You can have a delay of two weeks. Um, that's not really helping you when you want to treat something. So there is a push now to develop things on farm, assays on farm. And this is where um, our PhD student Agnes comes in. She looks at developing an on-farm diagnostic test for the key pick viral pathogen, which is the PCV2. Um, now, the main struggle was always to get DNA out on the field. I mean, how do you do that? No, normally, we have these kits and we have all kinds of sophisticated equipment. Um, off late, we have worked um, with Mike Mason, and he has developed um, um, a method, and we have um, basically validated this method on um, on rope. So what, what you do in the pig industry, you basically, it's very easy to monitor the pigs via rope because you don't have to touch the single pig, you just hang a rope into the pen. You then, after, because pigs are very inquisitive, they will chew on anything. So they'll chew on their rope. Um, you then cut the rope off and you squeeze it out. And then you cut the tip off and put it into a tube. So it's very easy. You can monitor 
very easy. You just leave them there or chewing on the thing, then you get it and collect it, and you have a sample. Um, now, the DNA extraction method actually works. We validated that. It works on rodents. Um, we used the real-time PCR and got, all, got samples back, and it, it, it worked. Rope samples worked. Um, so it can be done on the farm without any specialized equipment. So that was the first. Um, where am I? So we're now actually um, using a mini PCR machine, and we're validating that for on-farm use. Um, and we will use um, calorimetric detection to um, see whether it's positive or negative, the samples. This is, we're only doing this on one pathogen, but basically if this works, it will work on anything else because we get the DNA out and that's what we really want. So we could um, then use that for other pathogens. We could use these for antimicrobials, um, resistant genes. There's a whole area we could do with this. Um, we also do some research to support um, these diagnostic activities. We are involved in basic research looking at, at um, the impact of mechanisms that may assist T4 um, pathogens to avoid vaccine production, uh, protection. And um, I'll now come to outer structure. Um, Lida Omeleke is currently working to predict the outer lipopolysaccharide structure of Pastorella multicida. Has been shown that Pastorella multicida can produce truncated lipopolysaccharide structures, evading the immune system of the host. But I will let Lida tell you about this at a later stage. Um, we also do some glycon research. We have a PhD student. Nuswat, she's looking at toxin of Actobacillus pleuronemonia, which is a main pig pathogen. The hypothesis here is that repeat toxins um, are glycan, glycan binding toxins. And if we can find out the specificity of these toxins to certain glycans, then we can determine how to treat them and to prevent the binding. Um, be that by mimicking the glycan or by adding substances that will bind to these host glycans, so to prevent the binding of the toxin. Um, she is she's amplifying the toxin via PCR, then it gets cloned in an expression vector. Um, the resulting protein um, will then be screened with a glycomic glycan array, and selecting glycans will be screened. Um, Used to be screened, used to be to screen different strains of Actobacillus, Actobacillus pleuronemonia for high binding, and these interaction will then be further characterized. We're only at the start of this project, so um, we're looking forward to an interest to some interesting results there. Um, now, it's been an interesting journey. Um, we've done everything from raising piglets doing challenging experiments, to injecting rabbits to get um, antibodies, obviously lab work, obviously um, a lot of, lot of um, necro necropsy done, looking like space people. <laughs> and we've done, um, well, I've basically done some research on field. Um, this was done in New South Wales. I shifted pigs with a truck um, from one farm um, down the ranges, that was the most scary thing, me driving a truck. <laughs> <laughs> and we spent some nights at piggeries within a caravan, but we also seen very nice sunsets. Um, like to thank my group, wonderful people, done a wonderful job. Thank you for listening to the talk. <laughs>